the start. So, welcome everyone to what will be the last uh, meeting of this year. Would you like to move along the agenda? Let's uh, go to comment. Anyone got any declarations of interest? No, no. we'll vote chair. I think we'll have one more mic. I think we'll have one more mic. Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> but for people who aren't aware, this is council, they will find one, not council mic. So, okay, can you just confirm we're not subject to the party whip tonight? Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Let's move the two minutes. Are they agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Um, item number three, this is a notice of motion. Um, Bill, this is, you, you are presenting this notice of motion uh, as per um, council protocol. You know, give us seven minutes to speak to it. So, it's a shame that we haven't got the other numbers here, but we need to, we need to address uh, on that. Okay, I didn't think I had that effect on people for the government lessons on it. Well done, though. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, let's see where I First of all, Mr. Tour very kindly circulated a note yesterday, I don't know I sent a note to members with the summary of the cases <coughs> as shown on the. On the. the on the I circulated a note with the cases that I spotted on the Information Commissioner's website and copied that as a courtesy to Mr. Tour. And then Mr. George replied, sent advice to all committee members. Could I ask for each other what the status of Mr. George's briefing note is? What kind of document is it? Is it a public document or is it one that's not part of a committee report? Or is it part of a committee report so it would be disclosed in some form? Through you, Chair, it's a document which provides some factual information concerning FOIs and some context to the notice of motion members may have found um, relevant as part of the state debate and discussion around the new solution. Is it then available to anyone who wants a copy like a member of the other? Yes. Wow. Okay. So perhaps that could be arranged if there are any members of the want to see it. If it's not in paper form, then it might be emailed to them. I don't know the particular time period, but I'm looking at Mr. Tour's response to my notice of motion, if I perhaps deal with that first. Uh, then there's a difference of opinion about how we may interpret a few particular parts of decisions, but even on the analysis provided by our officers, 60.7% of 17 complaints were upheld, and in 43 decision notices, 42 complaints, 60.8% were upheld. And of course, if you add 60.7 to 7.1, you end up with 67.8. And if you're on 60.8 to 7.2, you end up with 68. So the calculation that officers made is not too distant from mine. So I'm going to just argue about that particularly. The second thing, I, of course, I appreciate that there was a panel that looked at FOIs and Council of Sites produced a report, which has a number of recommendations. And I see officers saying two are still being worked on. Certainly, one of the issues in that period was the issue of lateness. And I'll just um, refer to lateness, because the officers are saying a large proportion of rise out of lateness. One case in June 2015, uh, the commissioner investigated, in, during the quote from the report, during the course of the commissioner's investigation, the council provided the complainant with the information he requested. As this information was not provided within the statutory time for compliance, Commissioner considers that the council breached regulation 5.2 and its handling of the request. So there is an issue around time, and I welcome that the Reckless Council is now better organised to deal with these things. An issue was raised in the notes we received from officers about the something to do with the size of the council. And I looked, as a result of that, at the reports that were issued between September and the 19th of November, 3rd September, the 19th of November. So there were 104 reports were issued on various councils, of which 64 had upheld complaints, 89 not upheld, and 11 partly upheld. Now, we um, featured in that set of reports on three occasions, uh, with one partly upheld, another partly upheld, and one completely upheld. 
was with, it was big as baby distorted by, say, Salford in that time period. Uh, there were six counts against Salford in one case. Or there were three against Manchester City Council. Or there were five against Salford in that period. But there being a, a council as such being featured, we were featured three times in that period. And looking at councils that are quite large, Cheshire West appeared twice, Birmingham three times. So it might be something to do with councils, or it might be something to do with the views that officers are taking. But if I notice the motion, I ask whether we think that Osher's officers are being excessively cautious. I didn't mean to be offensive, but I'm asking perhaps if officers are perhaps defensive, and perhaps they're sheltering uh, behind the public interest test. Now, what I'm sure all officers will tell me is that they're defending the interests of the council, which is what we employ them to do. But in my looking at the freedom of information requests, there were particular cases that stuck out in the recent period. Um, There's a question of internal reviews. How often, perhaps we could hear, do our cases get to internal review? Because an answer has been sought and the person complaining has complained again and the council has gone back to look at it to reply to an internal review. I'll quote from one on the 1st of October. And this is case 505897778. She won't have, but I will explain. I'll read this paragraph. And it paints a picture of we're in a paragraph. And it's the one I want to bear in mind. Following receipt of the complaint, the commissioner wrote to the council to ask it a number of questions about its handling of the complainant's request. And, ask, and to ask it to provide a full explanation of its reasons for refusing the complainant's request. Regrettably, and this is the information the commissioner sent me, regrettably, the council's response was in, in, inadequate and ignored most of the questions asked by the Commissioner. Although it did confirm that for part five of the request, new information was held. And it goes on to say, the Commissioner contacted the Council to give it a further opportunity to properly explain its reasons for refusing the request, but it failed to receive a response of any kind. So, when you read into the reports, some things stand out. And uh, members may not like this, but I spent many happy hours looking at reports and reached some conclusions. And the conclusions I came to were perhaps influenced by me, but thank you, Chair. Are we excessively cautious? Are we defensive? And do we always respond to the public interest? And if the committee would like to commission some work on that, so officers can come back on those points, I think that would be a useful step. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to keep an eye on the seven minutes, Phil. Sir, do you respond to that, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, in, in terms of the Council's uh, overall uh, response that we do before to learn FOR requesting the <coughs> of the Freedom of Information Act as well as the Environment and Commission Regulations, I think it's uh, well known that there were a number of issues that uh, a little while ago that members would have been aware of in terms of the performance mode responding to FOIs and such requests. Um, resulting in fact with an undertaking we need to be provided uh, around the way in which we dealt with issues and that. Um, the, cons the way in which the, order, the council has responded I think has been quite positive in the sense that we have uh, over uh, recent uh, years uh, improved the way in which we respond to FOIs in terms of our response rate. The ICO said say a target of 85% responses needs to be achieved and we have a number of information provided you can see that we have consistently achieved above that target. Uh, I think it was uh, one month in December where we dipped to 84% and that was linked to the unpaid leave case uh, being a contributing factor. Um, so in terms of the Council's general performance, I'd like to think that actually our performance is very good against that, honestly. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that the Council gets it right every single time in terms of dealing with it. And there are occasions where clearly uh, exemptions are applied, judgments are exercised, which the ICO takes a different view too. Uh, and I think Council Bill has just made valid points around. There are areas that we do need to improve on and revisit and reflect upon. Issues around whether we are cautious or whether we are defending the Council's interests in a more robust way, or that's quite a long, uh, legitimate point to bear in mind and for all of us as officers to have regard to. 
Um, as I say, we will have to, uh, in advising colleagues and, and Dean and I respond to FOI as well, have to balance a number of competing factors. And as I say, we will exercise judgment around what the bill is disclosable or not as the case may be. Uh, and sometimes the ICO does agree with us and sometimes it doesn't. Um, and, and that's perfectly normal. Um, we will also take a board in guidance and advise the ICO and advise, and we often do. But that doesn't necessarily always mean that every FOI, some of which are quite complex and quite sensitive in nature, um, means that we do have to exercise some very strong balance areas around all the competing issues. Um, in terms of the actual timetable and responses, and I think Dr. Lopez Kane does raise a valid point around uh, the lateness and do we then respond robustly and properly to the ICO? There's a case that's example, example there. Um, I can't comment on each individual case, but clearly uh, we do, we don't ignore what the ICO requires of us. Um, as I say, sometimes we don't necessarily always get it right, and this is an example, and that's a case where we clearly have it. But overall, I think we do need to look at the overall performance. Um, we have come a long way since the previous uh, issues around it were uh, I'm not suggesting for a moment that we have got everything right and there's not further improvements to be made. Um, some of the recommendations of the scrutiny working, uh, working group are still outstanding. Uh, they are, are in training. We have a number of FOI champions being uh, within each department, so again, to ensure that we improve upon our recent uh, performances. Um, and as we read and we, we look at uh, these issues, I'm sure we will get more things right in the future. Um, so from my perspective, I appreciate the, the concerns and I think are perfectly legitimate to raise uh, in terms of offices having to reflect upon the points that Council Gilchrist has raised. More than happy for the committee with a further review in due course to see uh, what are the further improvements and test ourselves against a further member review. If you feel that's a bit more than happy, I would welcome that. Um, to see exactly what other areas and how we only applying uh, the rules and indeed our, our approach to FOIs. So as I say, overall I think there's good performance here, uh, but that's not to say there's further improvements coming Thank you, Sergeant. Will I open this up now to questions and comments from members? Steve? Can I just, um, well, whilst Councillor Gilchrist is here, I mean, the, the, the notice of motion, um, in itself is a fairly blunt instrument in a way of raising an issue. Um, you've heard from the director and uh, other people that this, this committee, uh, in its guise over a number of years, at the behest of the council, have been working on, on this issue. Um, first of all, the route that you've taken to, to raise the issue could have been done in a different manner and been brought to this committee. Could have written to the director, could have done it in a number of ways. So, first of all, uh, the tactic of going straight to full council with a notice of motion, uh, um, just just making, just asking you why why that needed to be the route. Second is the, the framing of, of the notice of motion in, in its terms. Like you can write notice of motions in whichever light or whichever way you want. I would have wrote a, a notice of motion based on the factual evidence given by the director saying something like, you know, we, we have been found wanting in 1% of cases, etc. So, you focus completely on, on, on the way you framed the question that, on, about those where there was an issue, rather than the overall picture. And I ask you the question, why you framed it in, 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 in such a way? Um, and I don't, I don't think anyone on this committee would ever argue about, if we have a target and a, a, a mission, we would want to improve. Um, I just ask everybody if, if on the committee or all people on the committee, if by any sort of measurable standard against national standards and others, we are performing as badly on this area, is this where we want to spend our resource, time and efforts? And I, and I understand the need for open, openness and transparency more, more, more than, than, than anyone, but I just, I just wonder why the notice of motion route not the normal, the normal channels using your good member on the committee and the way in which the, the notice of motion is framed as to um, not look at the overall picture but just to focus on, on those particular issues and I'm, 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 I'm interested in, in, in the reason behind that. Sorry to look at the passing plan. Thank you Chair. Um, firstly I, I just want to say I'm glad
glad to see that a lot of the recommendations have been put into place and that there is a, has been a general overall improvement in FOI uh, as, as regards to the rate of response. I think if we take a notice of motion though, that, that's not really regarding the rate of response at all. I think it is, it is looking at a separate issue, which is in the cases that there are um, complaints, a lot of those are upheld more than are not upheld. I think that is something that we could look at, and whether the, the route that it's come to might not be right, as Steve suggested. I think it's still worthy of having a look at this. Um, I think, given something that's not mentioned in here, is the amount of money that the council has to spend on FOI requests. It's, it's quite a large amount, and any, any amount of work that you do to, to save money for the council through reducing the number of FOI requests, whether that's by implementing the final recommendation of better search or uh, through other means, I think it is worthy of looking at. But I do take Steve's point, there's always other ways to bring things to a committee and get things moving. Steve, do you want to come back in there? Well, I mean, that was the, that was the beginning of my sort of uh, question and line with your body. The second <coughs> point Adam, Adam has raised is the totality of spend in dealing with FOIs. The source of our FOIs. I, from last time I was on this committee, there are a number of individuals who raise a large number of FOIs. And you know, if we're all being open and transparent, then can we have the names uh, and the list of those people who who call for FOIs, even in closed session uh, or not? And I think that may be able to put us our, ourselves in the context of what where we are, and what we are. Um, if that's not, you know, if that's not allowed, then it's only open and transparency from our side of things, isn't it? Um, but uh, as I say, my other my other question is, and um, Adam touched on it, if 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 the number coming in the form at the end has a set amount of cost, then we should reduce the numbers coming in the form at the end. But my and I don't know this, but I'm, I'm surmising. I know that some of those coming from the form coming from are from elected members who have lots of other routes to ask questions and identify issues rather than going straight to FOI. I say this again as a somewhat something of a cynic. I think it sounds better when you receive information through an FOI if it's juicy information that could have been asked in another way. It all sounds better in a newspaper article. This issue was found out by reason of an FOI when the question simply could have been asked. So if we're talking about improving the system, then I think elected members, members of the public, should be encouraged to just simply ask the question or use us as a resource, the elected members, to ask a question. We are their elected representatives, so there are other routes rather than an FOI. And I take on that and side at the point. If we can reduce the amount going in the funnel, then the main less mistakes at the end of the funnel simply due to volume. So they're my, my, my contributions. I am away and ask you see about things then you just want to respond to. <coughs> just for clarification, in terms of the identification of the request that uh, you can't disclose that as the yeah, the past is to ensure that you can disclose the request. That's pretty much Christina? Um, as I was with Adam and I think it was Stuart was in the on the um the looked at the FOI. Could I suggest that that group I don't know whether Stuart will be involved in one of the verses, if Adam and I and one other, look at this again. Because I think from what Phil's saying, it's, not, it's a completely different bit of it he's looking at. And it's a fairly valid point, isn't it? That, that, I mean, I, I don't think it's excessively high, and I don't think it would take as long to look at it. But if, as it's been raised, I can't see there's any harm in this as looking at it as a task and finish group, not as friendly as, as anything else. Thanks, Christine and Leah. No. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have to say, I do agree with what Adam says, and I do agree partially with what Steve says. Um, I think he makes a very valid point. One of the points that our councillors get in the line uh, do my own. FOI requests because then they can be a two different paper and it looks more juicy. Um, yeah, I, I've seen read that myself, I've seen it myself. But having said that, I've also been, I, I've never actually done that, but I've been in a position where I've wanted information from an officer, detailed information which hasn't been forthcoming. I think that's a very bad bit of always. You can't get the information, so yet you resort to an FOI, which shouldn't happen. I don't think any counsellor should have to get an FOI, but sometimes it's the only way of getting accurate information. So I, I, I 
see what you're saying first. I hear what you say, but I, I do think sometimes it's been necessary to have to say that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Adam. Just quickly on that, we did we did look at that when we did the task and finished that maybe the officers should be a bit more amenable with elected members when they do ask for information to avoid this becoming um, an issue for everyone. Somebody somebody else wants to speak to that? Thank you, Chair. Just just say briefly, I, I I do honestly feel very deeply regrettable when anyone has opposed to complaint regarding FOI, but I can't help but note that the complaints the council is receiving is 1.08% of those which are large, which seems, with regard to benchmarks, satisfactory. I would expect, whenever a complaint is upheld, the council to go for a review anyway to see what I went wrong and then try to kind of, I don't know, address that mischief. I'm not sure this, what you're requesting here, is, is necessary. I think that's done as a matter of course anyway. And given that Councillor Sykes' recommendations are either been implemented or in the process of being implemented, I can't help but think that this is maybe going off a bit half cock. Maybe we should wait until those maybe we should wait until those recommendations are implemented and then see whether or not these complaints take away. That's it. Thanks. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? Sure, sure. Can I, could I just say, it was a, it was a task and finish panel, not, not just my own. <laughs> 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 okay, so you've got a right to comply, Phil, and then we're going to take votes on this. Can I just ask a question, Jim, before you go to it, if you don't mind? Although we don't want to know um, who the people are that's sending the request in, can, can we request how many? Thanks, Sarah. Okay, so we've got 
Christina and Phil. Commissioner's Office 
They've been through lots of stages. They've been for us trying to solve it, investigate it, and it's reached, shall we say, the pinnacle of where it's considered. And we, we, I think we understand that the ICO is experienced in all this, and as our officers said, well, you know, they, they know um, how to approach these things, and I doubt that they do it lightly. One of the cases in the period I looked at was about how to benefit. And <coughs> let's say, in this case, the claimant started asking about it in September 2012. The council replied to it on the point that it was being asked in June 2013. And the ICO got the complaint in July 2013 and made their decision in November 2014. So the most difficult complex cases that we've touched on might take a long time to resolve. So I understand that. On the issue of members in FRI, uh, I don't believe I've ever used it myself. The former chief executive who's now retired assured me there shouldn't be any need for members to use an FOI by taking that office over at, 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 at uh, their word. Uh, Councillor Franks asked why he raised it through this route. And I did it because I think it would be a general issue which the council should see on its agenda rather than one that a member might ask for something to go on the agenda here. I'm not sure how much attention it would get if it went here directly how many members will look at all the minutes, all the scrutiny committees, and see what might factor an issue raised by a member. And I felt it was sufficient general interest to put it on the council's agenda. I hope it deals with that point. Mr. Cho, in his comments, said on several occasions there were a number of things that officers could well reflect on. I think that's an accurate summary. And if uh, that is part of the process of the task and finish group, then I'm quite happy for the task and finish group to look at that aspect. And, to receive some advice uh, courteously, privately, or whatever. Thanks, Bill. Um, just before we go to the vote, I've just got um, uh, an alternative amendment myself, which would be. The committee acknowledges that the overall number of complaints upheld by the ICO when we're up to 1.1% of all FOI requests received. We are committed to working towards improving how we respond to FOIs, and we recommend a further review take place.
Okay, so the next item on the agenda number four is um, we're on social media policy and Tony, you are going to come speak to the PC on this, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening to the committee. Uh, the report before you um, brings forward a proposed social media policy for the council. Uh, this report has been produced in conjunction with our investment uh, PR team. So I have with me Sally Lombard, who is our internal communications manager, uh, in case there are any questions that would be relevant to that type of things. Um, you'll be aware from these committees, we um, are currently on, uh, undertaking on the review of our HR policies and to make sure they are fit for purpose, legally compliant, and um, a useful resource for managers and employees. Uh, and the latest piece of work we've done is around the social media policy. The report goes into some background just around our use of social media as a, as a council and clearly I'm sure all the committee will be aware of the um, place of social media in today's society uh, and use of that. Um, obviously the council is, um, is making the same use of that in terms of uh, our communication channels. Um, the report notes that 87% of our uh, employees live in will uh, and so are able to access the council's communications and campaigns and on social media. Uh, sorry, using social media about the various news events that we have. Um, in that context, currently only a number, a limited number of council employees with a proven business case can access social media uh, sites such as Facebook and Twitter on their council PCs. Uh, and another number have permission based on business case again to run and manage social media feeds uh, on behalf of the council. This is a historic proposition that does not necessarily reflect how social media has changed. Um, as a consequence of this, we're not able to use the same channels of communication that we use externally, internally. And um, this includes, as I say, emotional council videos, etc. that we uh, are able to put on the public domain and all that stuff. Uh, the council's um, senior leadership team has agreed to broaden access to social media sites for employees, which means that employees will be able to use for council IT equipment to access social media sites. Um, and this presents opportunities for us to improve staff engagement through these channels. Uh, in view of that, um, it was necessary for us to have a um, policy around social media. Um, many organisations, different large organisations, will have this now. Um, and the councils, as I say, produce that in conjunction with our and PR colleagues. The policy sets out what would be expected of employees when so accessing social media for personal use, whilst at work, and also fixing on behalf of the council. Um, we've tried to keep it as a fairly straightforward policy and um, there's a, I think a, a danger of getting into too much detail around this particular area and legally it's still very much a minefield around um, use of social media. So it's hopefully a fairly pragmatic guide for employees and managers to follow. Um, we have consulted on a policy with trade unions and there are no particular issues of concern um, with the policy. Um, so I would invite uh, the committee to answer any questions they may have for the chair. Any questions or comments, Adam? Just a question, Chair. Um, firstly, it says that you want to use social media as a channel to promote the news and various things to staff. What if staff don't want to get involved in social media? Are they, you know, are they going to miss out all the opportunities? opportunities? And then the second question is, um, if staff are using social media now, how are we actually going to monitor how much they're using? Because it can have a big impact on productivity. As well. I know it does say that we'll be monitoring the content. Okay. Um, take the, the first question. Um, clearly, we communicate with employees in a variety of different ways, and that will continue. Um, we have regular emails from Chief of Tech and Principal Staff. Um, we also have um, a, a colleague's internal publication called One Week, uh, which again goes to staff for Cascades. Um, what we, 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 sort of, we wouldn't be kind of imposing any, any particular changes on it. But actually, in the communications that we do send out, particularly via email and then to staff in that route, um, we would be able to link them to external sites where there's something of relevance to the, uh, the council, for example, you know, a news item or whatever. At the moment, they simply couldn't access that from, from that embedded link. So it's a very practical step on that basis. We just supplement what we've got now. Um, in terms of um, monitoring use, um, we can do that now. Um, and the policy sets out a position that that would be only where we have concerns. Remain the no management issue really, and to monitor and, and maintain any kind of necessary vigilance about use. 
whether all those concerns our IT systems do support uh, any checking back and, and looking at, at use, uh, what pages have been visited, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the policy is quite clear, but we'll use that with us if it's there. Yes. Hi, um, just a quick one on section one, the resources and information. We discussed with IT services, but we didn't say anything else. We didn't say, you know, what the outcome of that discussion was, but I'm assuming it's to do with Bangalore. Consider if we get a reasonable sized email, we can't receive them until after six o'clock. Mm. I'm just wondering what the conversation was about, and what was the outcome of that conversation we got with Bangalore. And every employee could be sick. To sit down, especially at lunchtime, and start watching the video of the, of the network. Get through the check. Um, I think that's the tech of on the on the bandwidth side of it. Um, we discussed the opening up the channels with our IT colleagues um, when they were very confident um, in, in, in doing that, that they would present any particular issues. Um, we have actually opened some of these channels up now that are kind of um, particularly going to staff and, and, and making that as a, as a big announcement and not experienced any problems so far. Uh, the guest rooms need to be done with you, but I have seen any technical issues about you know, staff going on at the same time and, and we'll have to pick that up with IT. Thank you, David. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, interesting, I've had this dilemma about uh, five years ago and it ended up with 13 people being sacked, but I won't bring a, a dial on the proceedings. <laughs> If you're in effect saying you should follow the 